safety. Replication is a problem, but replication cannot by itself occur without there being a source of energy. So this is the Stanley Miller versus Tom Cech type of paradox. When Tom Cech and others discovered that RNA could self-replicate, the RNA world was created. And Stanley Miller created a world of proteins and metabolism first. And so I'm gonna explore that world a little bit with you today. Um, let's see if this, this will work, yeah. So <clears throat> let's just imagine that you could see half a bridge. And you know what's on that side. It's New Jersey. But you don't know where it came from. OK? So that's really where we're at. We see the outcome of an emergent property, which we call life. And we don't really understand what the building blocks were very well. So we know this is the issue of formation. That's me when I was younger and thinner. And you don't have to be a geologist to realize that these rocks were sedimentary materials deposited in the ocean 3.8 billion years ago. And you don't have to be a geologist or a chemist to realize that this orange stuff here is iron. Now, you're given an ocean which contains a lot of iron. Iron is very soluble, is an Fe2 atom or ion in under anaerobic conditions. So we have, a, I'm just gonna explain very quickly the, the chemistry of metals very, very quickly. If you really wanna go and look at the, the history of metals, the very best paper is the natural selection of the chemical elements by RJP Williams, Bob Williams, the late Bob Williams. It's a 1981 Bakerian lecture, not the book, the Bakerian lecture in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Now, iron, under anaerobic conditions, is soluble, so is manganese. Molybdenum and copper are in the sediments as sulfides. When you oxidize the ocean, the reverse happens. Copper and molybdenum become very abundant, and iron rusts out and becomes, even though it's the most abundant transition metal on the planet, very inaccessible throughout the world's oceans. Now, why do I go there? I go there because we have driving forces on the planet that produce something that is far from equilibrium. And the first driving force, of course, is solar energy. And I'm gonna to come to this, back to this in a bit. So this is the light at the top of the atmosphere, and it had more luminosity in the UV in the early periods of Earth's history. There's a, just for argument's sake, I know the astronomers are gonna freak out at this, but the, the, the rule of thumb, the rough rule of thumb, is the luminosity has decreased by about 1% per 100 million years. Fair enough? So at about 3.5 billion years ago, where I was standing at those Ishua formations, we're about 35% less luminous. And by the by, when we start talk about the faint young sun, it's my understanding that it's the disk of the sun that was smaller. Okay? It's not that the sun was the same size physically, but the disk of the sun was smaller. So if you get rid of the Fraunhofer lines and don't worry about the other issues here, there was an awful lot of UV light that hit the surface of the Earth. Today, that UV light is cut off by ozone. And somebody was asking me yesterday at dinner, why don't we have long wave uh, photosynthetic reactions in the ocean? Well, that's because the ocean absorbs so much of the red and far red light that it's virtually insignificant except for the upper couple of centimeters in the ocean. Now, why am I going here? I can take this mineral, siderite. So siderite is iron carbonate. For the people in the audience that are astronomers, this is calcium carbonate, okay? If you eat Tums for your tummy, that's magnesium carbonate. All I'm doing is substituting iron for the calcium here. And I'm making a mineral which doesn't exist very well in an oxidized atmosphere because it becomes rusts out. But in an anaerobic world, siderite was an abundant mineral. And here, 
I've just taken a UV light at 280 nanometers, and I, we shine it on this, and you can see we've rusted the iron because there's an anti-bonding orbital we've populated. For those of you who don't remember this, in quantum mechanics, there's, there are bonding and anti-bonding orbitals, and you can pop electrons off of any transition element with a photon. All right, so why do I care about that? Well, we can convert the siderite to magnetite. So you make a new mineral just with light, no oxygen required. So we can oxidize iron to iron three from iron two in the Archean Ocean just with photons. And you can do the same thing for manganese carbonate. You can oxidize it and you actually form a little bit of formic acid. The oxidation of Siderite leads to the production of hydrogen in both cases, actually. In virtually all these minerals that are photooxidized, you can get hydrogen. Now, this process is sacrificial. What do I mean by sacrificial? We make this reaction go to this product, and it doesn't go backwards. We've consumed it. Life is using these similar kinds of processes but is making it catalytic. Now, I'm sorry this didn't come out very well on this slide, but it's on this projector. Let's just go back. This is the Goldschmidt plot, which was shown yesterday several times. So we have the primordial elements of hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang, and then the lithium beryllium boron hole. Yeah? OK. The lithium beryllium boron hole. So if Steve wants a lot of borate, you got a problem to start. But then we come to carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and so on, blah, 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 blah. And I'll, I'm just going to point out to you here, iron is the most abundant transition element by far. And of these elements, six, the so-called big six, are the keys on making all of the polymers of life. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And as Steve pointed out, phosphorus, is one that undergoes acid-base chemistry. It doesn't undergo redox chemistry. So it's the only one that really is not important in redox chemistry. So life is a game of playing and moving electrons from reduced carbon, for example, to an oxidant. For an oxidant, for example, in the case of oxygen, to become reduced. And oxidation reduction reactions are the key to life. So of those elements, let's just go back a minute. Of these elements, of the six, hydrogen is the most abundant by far. This is a log scale where it's normalized at six to uh, silica. And carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are fairly abundant. And then we come over here, we have sulfur. It's about a log less abundant than oxygen or carbon or nitrogen. And then there's phosphorus. So of those big six, phosphorus is the least abundant. It doesn't mean that it's the least available. It just means it's the least abundant. All right. So we call these the big six. And obviously, most of you who have taken any kind of astrochemistry or introduction to biogeochemistry, we can just rearrange this where you put the H after this and you remember the word schnapps. Okay? So you can remember schnapps. Schnapps is a little drink in German, right? Now, I'm going to make this point. Life is electric. This is not a metaphor. It's electric. Every cell in your body has a potential across it. Every membrane in your body is a resistor and a capacitor in parallel. So you're not allowing ions to just freely be on both sides in the same concentration. That's an electrical field. That electrical field is in every living cell. It has to be generated by energy. It's not just there because of thermodynamic equilibrium. When you die, 
the membrane potential in every cell in your body will disappear. So in order for this to work, organisms have to derive energy by moving electrons from a substrate to a product. And therefore, all substrates and products must be cycled. So if there's methane on Mars, and it's produced by methanogens, and you don't have a methanotroph, you don't have a cycle, and that, can't, cause that cannot survive for billions of years. So biological processes are paired. And I'm going to talk about this in a very, very, very simple sense because I don't want to go into detailed chemistry. But the pairs of processes are like half cells. So you're a half cell relative to a plant, the other half cell, OK? So in the Archean Ocean, those processes, and we'll find this out later when we see Diane's talk uh, and demonstration. Um, the sources of, of electrons were hydrogen gas itself, produced, for example, from hydrothermal vents or from the photooxidation of siderite or magnesium carbonate and other minerals. So it was an abundance of hydrogen in the atmosphere. The hydrogen in this room today is zero. Zero. So there was iron, too. That was a potential source of electrons without hydrogen, by the way. So you, you had to find some other way of getting hydrogen into the system. Um, H2S from hydrothermal vents, and organic matter itself, organic matter that was delivered, for example, by chondritic meteorites or created in the atmosphere. Today, by far, the source of electrons is water, by far. Now, splitting water, which Bob Blankenship will talk about later, I'm going to talk very briefly about it, requires a lot of energy. If I just take a glass of water and I put it here in a bright light, Nothing will happen to it. If I put an alga in there and I shine the bright light, oxygen will be generated. That's a catalyst. Now, I just want to make this little point because uh, somebody was talking yesterday about how much water there is. And if you take a meter ruler and you say that's the diameter of the Earth, how thick would the water be? Two pieces of paper thick. That's how thick it is. And to demonstrate that, this is truly, today is the anniversary of the launch of Apollo 11. This is a picture from Apollo 11. It's a hoax, obviously. Um, <laughs> but if I took all the water on the surface of the planet and just put it into one bowl, that's all the water there is. And it is really, really, really remarkable that this planet has survived for 3.5 billion years. Well, let's just, since we know water was here at least, I mean, 4.3 billion years, um, the water has retained itself on the surface of this planet for that entire period of time, mostly in liquid phase. Now, I don't believe in God, but... Um, it is a very, very interesting phenomenon that we have titrated the heat from the sun just so that the water has not boiled off or frozen permanently. Now, this is one of the key takeaways. Um, Vernadsky, who really was the father of biogeochemistry and was an amazing person, actually, he was a Ukrainian, he was born in Ukraine, he was Russian, he lived in Moscow. He wrote a book which was published in Russian in 1928 called The Biosphere. And he recognized that geology and biology interacted. And he also made this incredibly interesting observation that all organisms on Earth exchange a gas with their environment via redox reactions. That means what do we implicitly understand about biosignatures? That organisms on the planet are changing the gas phase from equilibrium, right? That's the whole idea. So the 21% oxygen that we have in this planet is far from equilibrium.
Now, I'm just going to very, very put this very trivially up here. <clears throat> so oxygenic photosynthesis is a reaction where we take water, oops, take water, combine it with carbon dioxide, and make a sugar. And the waste product is oxygen itself. Now, if you take this as candy, just imagine this is candy for the astronomers. Well, I'm going to, the geologists, this is the way they think about it. So if this is candy, and this was in equilibrium, and we just are doing this. We're consuming the sugar, the candy, plus the oxygen, and two gases are coming out of our lungs, water and carbon dioxide. So you, as every breath you take, you're breathing out water. It's not evaporating from you. It's a reaction where you have put two hydrogen atom equivalents onto an oxygen atom to form water. It didn't hurt. So you simultaneously accomplished an oxidation reaction of the sugar and a reduction reaction of the oxygen. Where did all the oxygen come from? So students in the room, I'm going to give you a puzzler. We have 21% oxygen in the atmosphere. If all of that oxygen went back into the oceans as water, how high would the sea level rise? OK? That's puzzler number one. Number two, puzzler number two. This reaction is a four electron transfer reaction. And I'm, I'm sorry, every one of those electrons at pH 7 is moved with 0.82 electron volts. We can do some simple arithmetic. If, if there is approximately 100 gigatons of oxygen produced per year, that's about right. How much energy did it take per year to move those el electrons onto a carbohydrate to make the oxygen? And you can see, and when you do that calculation, when my friend Dan Nacera says, give me a swimming pool, a swimming pool full of water, and I will give you enough power to power New York City per day. So if you're sitting here trying to change the world, make that reaction happen with an artificial catalyst. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the evolution of nanomachines and the selection of biological catalysis. And this is a very, very, this is not going to be on the test, but I want to show you what we think about it in cartoon land. So this is the process by which we split water. It is the most complicated nanomachine on the planet. And we know the structures of these machines at very high resolution. I'll show you those in a second. But let's just take a look at what we talk about when we need a nanomachine. So there are two, this is a, a, a symmetrical dimer of two, uh, two processes. There are two reaction centers here, D1 and D2, diffuse band one, diffuse band two. The electrons are pulled out of a water molecule and they go through a series of electron transfers to another reaction center where another photon hits, which produces ultimately NADPH. And I just want to say one little thing here. This is amazing, think about this. We're dumping protons on this side of the membrane, and this is pH 7, 7, 5. This comes pH, pH 4. So there are 1,000 times more protons on this side of the membrane than that side. The protons will flow through this apparatus called the ATPase. As they flow through up this stalk, the ATPase literally rotates. These machines work. They're not static. They work. They rotate. And it produces the ATP in every living organism on this planet, whether you're photosynthetic or not. So this is in your mitochondria, my mitochondria. Now, this is the real structure. It's at 1.9 angstrom's resolution. And uh, Josh will show you a little bit later about how this works. But <clears throat> we know where every single atom is within that photosystem II reaction center that splits the water. And here's a puzzler, a puzzler for me, a paradox in a sense. 
The heart of this reaction center contains four manganese atoms, manganese one, manganese two, manganese three, manganese four, and a calcium with oxo bridges. These are oxygen. Where did this mineral come from? It is not found in nature. It's a one-off. There's no other protein that has that structure in the world. So where that reaction center came from, we really don't know. Bob may have some insights, but I don't think anybody really knows how we got photosystem two. We know parts of it. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with all this information, but this is a paper that was published, I think in uh, one of the annual reviews from one of my students. Um, so we have this metabolism first that was very, very based on very reduced things, hydrogen, H2S, iron two, and so on. And you needed a place to dump electrons. Everybody had electrons in those days. Nobody needed your stupid electrons. Okay? Where do you dump an electron? One of the most convenient places to dump an electron was nitrogen. So we get in the very early world nitrogen fixation making ammonia. And if you think about it, nitrogen fixation is actually a type of a respiratory reaction. Now, we come up to this funny event of the great so-called great oxidation event, and um, this is almost like a Caltech plot where we don't really know the numbers up here. Um, kind of a joke, if you're at Caltech, you know that. Um, we, get, we get some oxygen, and it may go up and go down, as Tim was talking about yesterday, but we allow new types of metabolism. So now, we can allow the oxidation of ammonia to be converted to nitrite and nitrate, which are soluble ions. And why would anybody do that in their right mind? Because they're using the hydrogen from the ammonia bugs to fix carbon dioxide without light. This is called chemoautotrophy. And then when we get to more and more oxidized conditions, we come to the world in which we live today, where all of the bugs that live down here in the early Earth's history are in refugia. They're in the Black Sea. They're in rice paddies. They're in places where oxygen is not very abundant. And the more sensitive you are to oxygen, the more of a refugia you have. So the methanogens are extremely sensitive to oxygen. They are in really, really, really anaerobic conditions. Some of these are a little less sensitive. And what I hope we can demonstrate today is that one, man, one bug's gas, excreted gas, is another bug's food, which makes it very difficult to detect gas exchanges in equilibrium like that. Now, a few years ago, with my friend Ed DeLong and um, Tom Fenchel, we wrote a little paper in Science proposing what would be a circuit diagram of all the metabolism on Earth. And this is it. So there's oxygenic photosynthesis, there's anaerobic photosynthesis or anoxygenic photosynthesis, and then there are all these rift pyres up here that are consuming the electrons that were generated from these guys down here by light. So that's the main driving force by far, by far. And actually I would argue even in hydrothermal vents, you would not have that disequilibrium if it were not for photosynthetic organisms 2,500 meters above your head. Now that diagram maybe looks to you like this. Actually, the, it's, we often call it the London Underground Diagram, but I'm going to give you a little analogy for the astronomers. Forgive me if it's a little too simplistic, but imagine you're in Paddington Station, or let's do it in Japan, because I, it's actually more interesting in a way. So in Shinjuku Station at rush hour, there are guys on the station with little white gloves and uniforms. And when the train comes in, the train is already so crowded that you, can't, you think you can't get on. Now, this is exactly, imagine the guy with the little white gloves comes and pushes you into the train, okay? So that's like the sun. He's pushing an electron to a place it doesn't want to be, in a more electronegative place. 
So if you're an electron, you're sitting there with all these electrons in this electron negative place. But you got there because of an energy from the sun. Now the train goes to the next stop and 25% of the passengers get off. They've used now that energy as a driving force. So that's the oxidation reduction reaction that really is what I'm trying to do here. Now, when you annotate that map, it turns out there are only about 400 genes in the entire planet, really, that create all of that meta metabolism. And how do they work? Well, now this is how I think about it. Imagine the Earth is like, oops, sorry, just the surface of the Earth is like a circuit, a plain circuit. We know we have a power supply, one power supply, the sun. We need a couple of wires. So what are the wires? Well, you're sitting in this auditorium right now, right? You're breathing oxygen. The oxygen is not made in this room. It's not made on your backs. You're not carrying around algae with you, right? It may have been made in Los Angeles, maybe. Probably not. I think LA is probably a net consumer of oxygen. So the oxygen is brought to you across the world by the atmosphere. So that's one wire. The second wire is the ocean. So those two geophysical fluids are moving oxidants and reductants around to all the organisms on the planet. If you don't have an atmosphere on a planet, you cannot really sustain life across the planet very well. Now, so we have one power supply, two wires, and we have 400 things that will transfer electrons. And let's see how those things work. So those things that move electrons are called oxidoreductases. Those are a class of proteins that oxidize and reduce things. And they contain transition metals. And I'm not gonna go into what transition metals are, but we have a whole bunch of these transition metals. So there's chromium, vanadium, um, titanium, um, zerbidium, molybdenum, ruthenium, so on. Now, if you go in and look at the inventory of all the oxidoreductases, by far, the number one transition metal in them is iron. The second most abundant is copper. And then you have small amounts of magnesium, uh, I mean manganese, nickel, molybdenum. Manganese, magnesium is not a transition metal. Now here's an example of an up close and personal look at what's called a four iron, four sulfur cluster. So this is a real mineral. And it's inside a protein that looks like junk to you. So I'm gonna explain what the junk is in a very, very simple way. You just think about three kinds of pasta, okay? So you have rotini, okay? That's the alpha helix, this is rotini. You have another kind of pasta that comes down here, lasagna, okay? That's lasagna. And you have a third kind of pasta, which is thin spaghetti. This is called the loop, so this is a sheet this is a helix, that's a loop. These are the secondary structures of proteins. And you're cooking them so they're somewhat al dente. They're not hard anymore. So they actually can flex. And what is called here is with this core of the iron sulfur clusters are four amino acids that are binding to it. They're special amino acids called cysteines, it doesn't matter. That's a fold in the parlance or the nomenclature of protein structure. Steve was referring to folds before. This is a more elaborate and very, very important enzyme, which has 38 iron sulfur clusters or irons plus sulfur, and in this particular case, one molybdenum atom. And this is the molecule, the only molecule on the planet 
that takes the nitrogen from the atmosphere and fixes it into ammonia that allows life. This molecule is extremely uh, sensitive to oxygen. If you add oxygen to it, it rusts, the iron rusts out, non-functional. So it evolved in bacteria. It has never been found in a eukaryotic genome. So a dream of many plant biologists is to put this into corn because we spend a huge amount of energy supplementing what nature does in making ammonia with a very expensive process energetically called the Haber-Bosch reaction. And here's another molecule, superoxide dismutase. This takes a reactive oxygen that you produce in your bodies and many organisms produce in their bodies when they're exposed to oxygen and reduces it back down to something that is not harmful. So if you are running, if you're doing aerobic exercise, you are really killing yourself. Do not do that. Okay, you are producing reactive oxygen species and it is all the pomegranate juice in the planet won't help. In this case, Trump is correct. And there are many types of superoxide dismutases. I'm not gonna bore you with all this. What I wanna point out is we can take and put 100% loop up here in a nice oxalase diagram 100% sheet, 100% helix, and we can put every single one of the proteins, and these are not all of them, that are in the protein data bank, which is the structural group in uh, uh, proteins, and we can array them with how many lasagnas did you have, how many rotinis did you have, and how much spaghetti did you have around that core. And then you can draw vectors from every single point to every single other point here. And we're going to make one Bayesian, one Bayesian prior. The Bayesian prior is that if you start up here, you have fewer hydrogen bonds, so you're less stiff, so you're more evolvable. And if we put this in hydrogen bond world, this is what we would call the primordial polypeptide. That's the primordial protein. And then you have a world which is very, very stiff and very, very, very stiff down here. Many hydrogen bonds. And why do I care about doing that? Because now we can make a tree of the evolution of the enzymes that create life without worrying about the bug. There's no RNA world here. There's no DNA world. I don't care where these proteins came from. I'm only thinking about their structure. And the first structures that we see up here are iron hydrogenases. They are coming from that four iron, four sulfur cluster that I showed you for the ferrodoxin, very simple molecule. <clears throat> and they are able to split H2 into H plus plus electron or reversibly take H plus plus electron to make H2. And then we have this what's called loop clade and sh uh, sheet clade and helix clade. And I just want to come down here, the last one. I don't want to bore you with all these. So here's the sheet clade. We have a group of dicopper containing uh, molecules. Those are the molecules in your lungs and your mitochondria that allow you to breathe oxygen. Now, what is the evolution of those structural motifs? And it goes back to a paper by Richard Eck and Margaret Dayhoff, a prescient paper in 1966. And think about this. The processes of natural selection severely limit any change in a well-adapted system on which several other essential components depend. That means that the nitrogenase, which is dependent on other proteins, is not evolving, basically. It's stuck. Photosystem 2 is stuck. Those real core nanomachines are very, 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 very highly conserved. Now, when we go and look at the folds, which I'll show you in a second, instead of finding 400 genes, there are only 35 Legos in the box. Everything was made out of 35 Legos. The Lego kit. There are only 35 Legos. So you have one power supply, two wires, 35 Legos. With all those Legos, you can make all 
the elect electron motions on the planet. And how do we dissect it? So we're putting these little Legos up here, but what we do is we come and we make a network of the structures. And we see four major structures, for example, the ferrodoxin fold, which has the cysteine asymmetry fold. I'm not gonna bore you with these. This was published. And this is basically how we do it. We take a look at the proteins and we look at all the metal centers in this particular case, and we break them out. And then we make what we call a spatial adjacency network. And from that spatial adjacency network, we can make a network of which came first. So bacterial ferrodoxin in this particular network was the mother of all of the main protein structures that produce electron transfer reactions on the planet that we have structures for. So that bacterial ferrodoxin is a core structure. Now we have one other thing that we've done in the recent years. It's actually cooking right now in a journal. So this is not published yet. So we went back to the protein data bank and there's another half of the oxidoreductases that transfers protons with electrons. They don't necessarily have metals. They have NADPH, FADH. These are the hydrogen carriers. And we put those into a network and we come up with this kind of network analysis. So here's the ferrodoxin fold that I just told you about. And then there's another fold called the Rossman fold. Now the Rossman fold is rotini, lasagna, rotini. You worked with Rossman, no? No. So these are what the folds look like. The ferrodoxin fold, the Rossman fold, and let me just show you when we start to build these up. This is the synteny of the genes. That's the sequence in which the gene structures work. The ferrodoxin fold and the Rossman fold co-evolved. And they are the two core Legos of life. Now, let me show you how core they are. So all of the structures in blue are Rossman folds. And this is the wood, so-called wood Longdahl pathway. This is the first pathway that fixes carbon dioxide on the planet that we know of, extant, without producing oxygen, obviously. And it's a very, very, very primitive pathway, but just look at how many times nature has taken that same fold and used it and appropriated again and again and again and again and again in different, different enzymes. Now, I'm gonna to come to a short end. So, Steve mentioned chirality. All amino acids in our proteins are so-called L. So it's based on the plane polarization of light. That's how we get the levodextory versus uh, the dextory, the L versus D amino acids. The only amino acid that's not chiral is, uh, is uh, glycine. Well, we can design a peptide, and this you cannot do in a bug, this has to be done in a peptide synthesizer, of taking D-cysteine, uh, L-arginine, D-arginine, L-cysteine, so on, LD, 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 and make a cage, and put a four iron, four sulfur cluster in there. Only 12 amino acids here. Really, 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 really small. And we can make a ferrodoxin that's very stable. And we're doing this with other proteins. We just published in uh, PNAS a few weeks ago, sorry. Um, and Josh, who's going to give the pymol talk in a little bit, um, is trying to make an artificial hydrogenase. That's that. So that's the Feynman world in which we live, trying to synthesize those simple proteins that move the electrons around really, 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 really hard. We are really babies at understanding how nature evolved these machines. 
So I'm just going to leave you with, uh, we're at a very poor part right now. Hopefully things will look up in the next decadal review. But our ability to capture photons from exoplanets is very, very, very difficult, as you all know. And it's a limiting factor in understanding what those planets' habitability is like, what that, those planets' gas phases are really like, and how far out of equilibrium are they. I'm just leaving that with you because applying what we know now to what we want to know in the next two decades is, is really dependent on machines, not our imaginations. We've been doing the imagination stories for decades. We can simulate a lot of things, but I'm talking about really making toys that go off into space and doing the space-based missions, or if possible, doing the very, very large telescopes on land and using either Doppler shifts or some other technique to try to get spectra of uh, planets uh, that are within, uh, with, within the error of our atmospheric directions. So I'm going to uh, find this conclusion. The first two and a half billion years of Earth's history was what I call the research and development phase. This is when Microsoft invented its, its code. So that was code one. And then it spent a whole bunch of time repairing the code. That's what it basically did. All the metabolic processes were developed in prokaryotes. Those are organisms that don't have nuclei, membrane-bound nuclei, okay? So you and I are eukaryotes. And as one eukaryote speaking frankly to other eukaryotes in the room, we're not very interesting from a metabolic perspective. We are just E. coli with eyes, for the most part. Um, there are approximately only 400 core metabolic genes that make all the electrons flow across the planet. And these sequences are coupled on local and planetary scales. And the no, entire electronic potential an is driven by oh, there you go. If you want a bagel, I have to walk back to IPAC. All right. So um, there are a lot of people that work in my team. This is a little bit outdated. I should update it. Uh, some of you may know Dave Case. He writ, wrote the AMBER code for oxidation reduction reactions. Uh, Debashi Jana is uh, uh, really strong in, in bioinformatics. And my colleague in crime is Vic Nanda, who is a structural biologist. Um, from very, very, very nice person to work with. And I'm just going to say thank you. <laughs>